Thank you very much. Um, as Katharina said, my name is Hien Ngo. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers and the amazing team here um, at the United Nations Institute for Integrated Management of Material Fluxes and of Resources, UNU Flores. Katharina has given an extensive background for you uh, of me. I was um, at the technical support unit for both uh, the pollination assessment and the global assessment of IFBES. So I don't usually like to use acronyms, but for IFBES, I will. It is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is quite a mouthful. Um, I'll talk really about IFBES and some of its work uh, as of late, and then I'll tell you a little bit about a publication that's come out recently on Biodiversity Climate Society Nexus. Um, I really encourage um, the audience to uh, make comments and questions like Katharina said. I really like the engagement, even though this is over Zoom and virtual. So um, I invite you to do that. And okay, so this is just um, an orientation slide to let you know that I will be speaking about it best. So have no fear. If you've never heard of it best, I will tell you a lot about it best, uh, but not so much that it's overwhelming. I'll talk about my main work uh, up until 2019 on the global assessment. It is exciting new work on the Nexus assessment, which is currently ongoing. Um, something we completed last year uh, with IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And then the paper that I mentioned uh, on the biodiversity, climate change and society Nexus. So what, is IPES. Uh, IPES is an independent intergovernmental body established in 2012. It has almost 140 uh, member states as parties to it. Uh, IPES's mission, as you can see up there, is mainly to strengthen the knowledge foundations for better policy through science and evidence for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, long-term human well-being and sustainable development. IPES's first work program was in 2014 until 2018, and I was there for the whole thing. And now it's in its second work program, 2019 until 2030. I should mention that IPES has a collaborative uh, arrangement with UNEP, UNESCO, FAO, and UNDP, another bunch of acronyms, apologies for that. And it's hosted, uh, the Secretariat is hosted in Bonn, Germany. So for those of you that don't know uh, IPES at all, you might be wondering, what does IPES even do? Well, um, it has four main functions um, in the first work program, which is similar to the second work program's functions. It assesses knowledge, uh, it provides policy support, it builds capacity, and it strengthens knowledge foundations. Now in the second work program, they've included two more objectives which uh, don't align with the four functions. I've highlighted those in orange there regarding communicating and engaging and improving the effectiveness of the platform. So um, if you are interested in more information about it best, there's a lot of literature out there, but I really like this short piece by Thomas Brooks, uh, really comparing it best and IPCC. So people have said IPES is an IPCC-like mechanism for biodiversity, but there are some key differences. So in the paper, which was published in 2014, he really outlines that IPCC does mainly one function, which is assess the knowledge and evidence base for climate change. But as you can see here, IPES does so much more. Uh, not to say that the work of IPCC is not excellent, uh, because it is. So IPCC informs the work of UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, similarly, it best informs the work of CBD, but like Elizabeth just said in her uh, uh, talk, um, the products that are produced from IPES try to target a range of end users. So not just the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. So I am most familiar with assessing knowledge function and assessing knowledge just means that uh, we develop uh, assessment reports with a group of experts. So not me alone, but I've worked with literally hundreds of experts uh, to develop some of these knowledge products out of IFBES. 
So the first ever products out of IPBES uh, and something that we wanted to do as um, low hanging fruit uh, was the thematic assessment on pollinators, pollination and food production. They are highlighted in uh, the red box and also the um, methodological assessment on scenarios and models. Those were approved in 2016. And because of its success, we continued on with a thematic assessment on land degradation and restoration, and then four regional uh, assessments uh, that you see there that were all approved in 2018. But the largest assessment and the landmark assessment uh, produced by IPBES is, is the global assessment, which was completed in 2019. This global assessment was led by three co-chairs, Sander Diaz, Eduardo Brandizio, and Joseph Settley. And it involved over 150 experts and it spanned over about three years from 2016 until 2019. Patrick over here was a very uh, valuable uh, author in the assessment process and he was part of chapter five, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so if you also have any questions for him about chapter five, you can post those in the question box. So as you can see, uh, the IPBES Global Assessment tried to do everything uh, as best we could. We tried to critically assess the state of knowledge, past, present, and future trends in multi-scale interactions between people and nature, taking into account different worldviews and knowledge systems. Uh, authors examine status and trends of direct and indirect drivers of values and response options. The geographic scope was uh, land, inland waters, coastal zones, and oceans. So uh, it was approved in 2019 in February in Paris, France, at uh, the seventh meeting of the parties of IFBES, IFBES 7. There was an unprecedented response from the media and wider public when this report was released on May 6. Um, there was uh, 39,000 total online and traditional media news articles um, that spanned 165 countries and territories and 49 languages. Um, one of the key messages that we didn't see uh, taking over the media space was this kind of um, finding of uh, 1 million species, plant and animal species were threatened with extinction. And uh, this, is, this cartoon is obviously based on that. Um, I'm just going to show you other headlines that I really liked that were released on that day. Le Monde is a big French outlet. Uh, and, and this is basically, uh, it's not too late to act. And then um, the political impact and recognition immediately was something that was really great for the authors and the knowledge products. Um, so here we had a debriefing with the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, on May 6th. And then May 6th and 7th, the G7 environment ministers met in METS and established a biodiversity charter based on the global assessment where they committed to fighting biodiversity loss, tackling climate change and, and inequalities. And you can see there he's reading the actual summary for policymakers uh, there. And then this is just to show you that there were headlines around the world uh, and not just in English, but uh, in, in other countries and in other languages. And I'd like to also point out that May 6th, the royal baby Archie was born, and we managed to uh, <laughs> bump out that uh, headline for ours, which was a, a, a nice uh, bonus, although a baby is a big deal. So, okay, so aside from the ra uh, awareness raising that the global assessment managed to do with a wider public and the media impact, the global assessment also did important work in terms of science policy interface. As I mentioned before, the global assessment informs policymakers, those a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity regarding the progress towards achieving targets, namely the IT biodiversity targets, which were the last decadal targets from 2010 to 2020. Unfortunately, it showed in the global assessment, we did not reach any of the targets set out in 2010 for the world. Authors showed that there was good progress on some components uh, only four of 20 IT biodiversity targets. A good example of where we achieved some success uh, on achieving targets was protected area target 11, which by 2020, at least 17% of terrestrial and inland water and 10% of coastal and marine areas were to be conserved. 
Now, the global assessment was the main body of work informing the Convention on Biological Diversity's parties on the progress towards the achievement of these targets. And it also informs the party on the status of nature, its contributions to people, and drivers for the upcoming post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which Elizabeth talked about. Elizabeth also mentioned that the draft global biodiversity framework has four overarching to uh, goals with 21 action-based targets. And this will be confirmed and discussed at the upcoming COP15 later this year. Now I stole this slide from the deputy executive secretary of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it's really a simplified schematic to show how IPBES and its knowledge products there in blue have contributed to the evidence base which policymakers actually look at. So policymakers cannot read all these assessments and they cannot read all of these reports. So what we did at IPBES was synthesize a lot of the reports and key findings, for example, in the regional assessments, in the thematic assessments, namely in the global assessment. And the secretary at the, at the CBD took national reports, they took NBSAC implementation information, they took other indicators, and then they wrote the Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, which Elizabeth also mentioned in her talk. And this is what informs the decision makers at that level in order to negotiate and discuss the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So this is a Nexus conference, and uh, we did focus on aspects of the Nexus approach, and I wanted to highlight Additionally, what the global assessment did within chapter five, for which Patrick here was an author. The global assessment also looked at global goals, such as the sustainable development goals and how to approach that uh, through the nexus. And, and, and they did this considering interactions between diverse goals and sectors. From a scenario-based review and a synthesis of broader literature, Patrick and his colleagues analyzed interactions between multiple sectors and objectives through the nexus approach And these were the six foci of the, of the chapter five. I will not read these out as you can see them on screen, but as you can see, they're clustering relevant SDGs together to look at uh, different interactions, different sectors uh, and different themes all at one time, which is basically the nexus approach. The work we did in the global assessment was just scratching the surface in terms of the nexus approach. And this was made clear by policymakers. Therefore, in this next slide, you have a snapshot of IPBES's second work program where they heavily rely on nexus elements and the nexus assessment. So in topic one, you're really looking at uh, those evidence and the importance of um, biodiversity in, in achieving the sustainable development goals with two deliverables. One is the thematic assessment on interlinkages between biodiversity, water, food, and health, i.e. the nexus assessment. And also I'll talk briefly about the second deliverable, which is a, a paper um, looking at the interface between uh, biodiversity and climate change. So for those of you that are interested in the nexus assessment, it is underway. Last year it was approved by governments of IPBES, uh, governments to IPBES for undertaking. So it started last year. And as all assessment processes go, processes go, um, it goes through author meetings, several public uh, reviews, uh, which you can all take apart, register for and look at the drafts. And then it's actually going to be delivered in 2024, as you can see. So this is a very simplified uh, timeline, but I really encourage you to get involved as reviewers uh, if you're curious about this topic. Here I just show a snapshot of the chapter structure that was agreed upon by governments uh, and developed in, in collaboration with experts on what the nexus assessment should entail. And these are just general points covering all of the chapters. Uh, they look at the state of knowledge, including indigenous and local knowledge on interlinkages. The assessment will be global in scope, but they look at regional and sub-regional similarities and differences. All chapters will highlight synergies and trade-offs between nexus elements, which is very important because no one element works in a silo. 
um, and define social, economic, and environmental impacts, as well as thresholds, feedback, and resilience. So really, I would like to say that this nexus assessment unpacks and complements the global assessment and what was achieved in 2019, doing a deeper dive into these issues of synergies, trade-offs, thresholds, feedbacks, and resilience. The second deliverable, which was in the red circle that I wanted to highlight for you was this uh, report, this technical report um, between climate change and biodiversity, which we did with IPCC. This is the first ever collaboration between these two intergovernmental bodies. There were 15 leading experts uh, taking part in this uh, process, this workshop. It was co-chaired by Hans of the who is the co-chair of IPC's working group two uh, for the sixth assessment cycle and the late Bob Scholes. Uh, a virtual workshop was held in uh, late 2020. Um, and then this report was presented in June of 2021, and it's accessible if you are interested. Uh, just briefly, it was divided into seven sections. And if you have any questions on what the difference between a report and, and an assessment is, I would be very happy to answer that in the Q&A uh, session. But I would just like to highlight a few of the key findings from the workshop report and resulting paper. The Earth's climate and biodiversity are inextricably connected with each other and with human futures. They reinforce each other and therefore cannot be managed in isolation from each other. It's unfortunate that we have a convention that's uh, more focused on biodiversity and another convention that's more focused on climate. But as we see that these are very closely linked, we'll have to further work together uh, in the future to achieve um, global goals for both. A sustainable future requires both a stable and safe climate, as well as a diverse, productive, and robust ecosystems, sorry, on land and in the ocean. The relationship is that climate change can exacerbate risks to biodiversity and natural and managed habitats. At the same time, these natural and managed ecosystems and their biodiversity play a key role in the fluxes of greenhouse gases, as well as supporting climate change adaptation. Please note that in this diagram in the corner, obviously you can see the very strong element of a good quality of life and human well-being, which should be taken into consideration. The report also highlights that treating climate change, biodiversity, and human society as coupled systems is key to successful outcomes. To be successful, conservation and climate action would go hand in hand across landscapes in cities as well as rural areas. Uh, there is going to be a very interesting talk tomorrow uh, by Professor Tan on cities uh, and urban ecology. So I really uh, also um, would uh, urge you to go to that keynote talk tomorrow. It's really necessary to consider the three-way interactions among biodiversity, climate change, and society in order to effectively ma maximize co-benefits and minimize these trade-offs and co-detriments uh, that we referred to previously. So out of that report on IPCC and IPBES, uh, we unpacked some of these things and ha have this pub paper that was submitted and accepted. Um, what I'm showing you here is uh, going to be in bioscience fairly soon and it's entitled Governing for Transformative Change Across Biodiversity, Climate Change, uh, Climate and Society Nexus. So first of all, you might wonder uh, what do all of these terms mean? What's transformative governance? And then there, this is how we define it in the paper and also in the report. Transformation implies fundamental changes both across societal structures and beliefs and behavior dimensions uh, that new social ecological systems are created. And this is kind of contrasted with the incremental changes that we've traditionally seen in the past. Um, governance really refers to the use of a uh, combination of formal and informal and public and private institutions across actor networks at multiple levels. To be transformative, governance approaches need to be uh, integrative, adaptive, equitable in order to account for social complexities of this nexus between biodiversity, climate and society. That there is a picture of the last meeting of the Substa, 
um, of CBD um, in Geneva last month or two months ago, where they were discussing the post-2020. Within this paper, we also discuss uh, five principles for fostering transformative governance within this nexus, this biodiversity climate society nexus. We like to focus on multifunctional interventions, integrate and innovate across scales, <clears throat> which is a, a challenge, creating coalitions of support, ensuring equitable approaches, and building in social tipping points, both positive or sorry, positive. We do this and illustrate it by using four case studies in the paper. Uh, as you can see here, they're in red. They span a, a range of situations, uh, context, and regions uh, governing red plus in the Brazilian Amazon, high seas fishing and governance, redlining and tree planting in urban areas, uh, Inuit co-management of marine ecosystems. So the paper also illustrates that most current governance approaches to deal with biodiversity climate society interactions do not sufficiently address their causes and impacts at appropriate scales, nor do they adequately engage the range of actors who have divergent worldviews and their associated values about human nature relationships, ranging from incorporation to, of cities to indigenous peoples and local communities. The nexus, the biodiversity, climate, and society uh, nexus challenges are cross-cutting. Uh, they have feedback loops. Um, they're non-linear and potentially are very fast. I just sped through this and this is my <laughs> uh, last uh, slide, excuse me. Um, so uh, basically the paper, the IPCC IPBES report um, will uh, support each other in some of these conclusions. So actions to mitigate climate change can either be beneficial or harmful on biodiversity, depending on the policy. Biodiversity assists people and ecosystems to adapt to climate change and, and conversely actions that halt slow or reverse biodiversity loss can also help mitigate climate change. Ignoring this inseparable nature of climate, biodiversity, and human quality of life will result in non-optimal solutions. Where policy interventions facilitate transforming social structures to create the necessary conditions for tipping positive social behavior, they are more likely to succeed in addressing the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity. So I want to thank all of you for listening to that. I was trying not to overload you with too much uh, it best information, uh, but um, my life has been around assessments in the science policy interface. So if you have any questions and there's no such thing as a bad question, I really encourage you to ask uh, and engage in this next session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yen.